Are you really guilty if you kill someone because you think they're a supernatural creature and they represent a threat to your community? Believe it or not, this is a legal dilemma that haunted English courts for about 200 years. Today I'm telling the story of yet another supernatural creature to have terrified Londoners during the 19th century. My name is Claudia and you're listening to Blackbird Tales. And welcome back to the only monthly podcast who only comes out every six months. I have been less than regular with Blackbird Tales and I really apologize. But I do have now a backlog of episodes. So you can look forward to listening to more Blackbird Tales. I've had a bit of a logistic problem. Um, I moved flats and I don't really have any place that is perfectly silent. So I'm sorry if you can hear cars, etc. But I mean, I live in London. I don't really have the financial means to afford a podcast studio in my living room. So yeah, hopefully it's not going to be too bothersome. And if it is, um, well, I'm sorry. (laughs) You're going to have to find another podcast. I'm just assuming that the people listening to this podcast are not very fussy because between the very poor sound quality and the very heavy French accent, I guess I guess you're not really easy to annoy. <laughs> so without further ado, let's start this story. We're in Hammersmith in October 1803. For those who don't know, Hammersmith is an area of London that is west of London. At the time, it's very much the periphery of the capital. So imagine a place that is not very urban, but not quite rural yet. So at the end of this year, 1803, in Hammersmith, the atmosphere is not the best. It's quite, it's quite stressful for everyone, really. So, in around October, this rumour starts going around that the church graveyard is haunted. Some people, apparently, have been not really attacked, but really scared of by quite a belligerent looking, I don't know, mad woman, I guess? Like, a woman who is described as wearing uncuffed dresses and who's just running around the church graveyard being ghostly, I suppose? So people start talking and they start saying, yeah, there's this ghost. She's, you know, she's really scary. She's weirdly dressed. She actually looks a bit weird. And at some point, this man called Mr. Moody goes across the church graveyard and sees said ghost and realizes that's not a ghost at all. It's not even a mad woman because it's not a woman at all. He recognizes a young servant and this young lad is actually wearing someone else's dresses another servant uh, like a woman and apparently he's mad at her because apparently i think so something along the line of she rejected him something like that so to take revenge on her because you know patriarchy uh he steals her clothes and he just goes around i i guess he damaged the clothes as well because they're described as rags really Uh, And he just goes around scaring people off, trying to basically impersonate her, like in the hope that people will recognize, you know, the way, you know, he's dressed and think that it's actually the woman, you know, the the woman he stole the clothes from. So Moody is, so the man who unveils the plot, (laughs) um, he's really not happy with that. I guess he's an older man and maybe he knows the guy, the young lad, and he's just like, you know, giving him 
a massive bollocking and then the you know the the scary wo ghost woman disappears and is never seen again well at least this particular ghost is never seen again because it's like the seed has been planted now in the hammersmith community and different rumors who are more or less verifiable start going around it's a very small seemingly tiny community so everyone seems to know someone who has seen the ghost so now instead of being a, a mad ghostly woman um, the legend says that it's um, the ghost of someone who committed suicide so at this point i think we need to take a break and explain you know why specifically someone who committed suicide and it's not necessarily because of you know their tragic backstory with mental illness but it was very much because of funeral practices um, for people who committed suicide were really really both specific and incredibly ruthless so for example people wouldn't get uh, funerals they would get buried in unconsecrated grounds and for some of them there was this weird practice which might ring a bell but i promise you it has nothing to do with vampires um, they would put a stake through the body before burying them at crossroads um, you know like the whole point was to make sure they wouldn't get like a, you know the christian honors uh, usually given to the dead because uh, you know Christians felt still feel quite strongly about suicide so it was considered such a sin that you you wouldn't get honored after you died and because you didn't get buried in unconsec uh, in consecrated ground it meant that I guess you you wouldn't rest properly I guess that's why like they imagined that you would not rest and you would come back as a ghost so here we are in hammersmith with a ghost that is specifically a suicide victim so now we've taken this tangent we can go back to the story and we can go back to hammersmith where this ghost in particular is now terrifying the area especially because it's much less you know tangible and also because there's a very, very tragic story going around that is not verifiable. It's very much a rumor. And the story goes this way. There was a woman who was pregnant or she was an old woman. It's either or, but anyways. So a woman who's in quite vulnerable, let's say. Uh, she's going across the church graveyard at night and a large white figure emerges from a gravestone and then hovers towards her so at this point of course she tries to run away but the ghost is actually really quick and grabs her by the arm that's when the woman faints and stays unconscious until some people who are like passerby spot her lying inert in the in the graveyard so they bring her back to her home and apparently she never recovered and she died after a few days because she was crushed by the shock of having met a ghost so as i've said this story is very much a rumor what we do have in terms of historical you know traces is a testimony actually of a man called Thomas Groom who says that he has personally been victimized by the Hammersmith ghost. According to Thomas Groom, he was walking across the church graveyards when he felt someone or something grab him by the throat. Then he started to scream and someone came to his rescue and when he turned around, no one was there. So he immediately assumed that he had been attacked by the ghost because, you know, he was in the very place that all these rumors are about and he gets attacked by an inv invisible assailant. 
I think Groom's story is interesting because despite the fact that the man who helped him didn't see anyone, um, that himself didn't see anyone, he still came to the conclusion that he got attacked by the ghost. And I think it says a lot about the general climate in Hammersmith back then that people were probably thinking and talking about this ghost quite a lot and that this church graveyard was notorious to be haunted at this point and that people were probably quite cautious when you know crossing it back then so side note to do my due diligence i did go to hammersmith because the church still exists to this day technically i don't think it's the same building um, I think everything has kind of been rebuilt in 1834, something like that, Victorian time, a bit later. And um, currently, the graveyards that, you know, where the ghost seems to be living uh, doesn't exist anymore because the Hammersmith flyover stands where the graveyard used to stand. So, yeah. If you think that the Hammersmith flyover is haunted, um, maybe we have a very strong case. So I thought I would just make that side note for if we have amateurs, Ghostbusters <laughs> in the audience. But let's go back to our story. So as I've said, the climate around Hammersmith at that time might have been a climate of, you know, low-key panic and general ghost frenzy. To add to this general atmosphere, the local watchman, a man called William Girdler, also claimed that he met with the ghost. At the end of 1803, at the end of December, he says that he was doing his usual beat when he came across a white figure. Immediately alarmed, he started to pursue the figure, but he started to realize that it wasn't really a ghostly figure, and it, it was someone covered with a sheet. It's actually quite difficult to tell what Girdler think about the ghost, because he seems to be very hands-on and very down-to-earth when he talks about, you know, a, basically a guy wearing a sheet, So sometimes it's a little bit difficult to tell were these people actually believing a ghost was haunting them or were they really scared of really dodgy characters who were dressed as ghosts to terrify people, which is just as scary. So Girdler says that he pursued the ghost, but he ended up losing it. But he did see the ghost take off his sheet and kind of like stuff it under his coat or something. So after that, he just went around the area, like down the pubs, etc., asking people, have you seen someone looking dodgy? And he actually met a few people saying, oh yeah, I saw this bloke who had like this massive napkin, like peeking from under his coat and like dragging on the floor. So clearly, I don't, I just can't imagine Gurla actually thought there was a supernatural being hanging out in his area. But anyway, so that's basically the background of our story today. This is Hammersmith. All these rumors are going around. Everyone is really scared to go across that very church graveyard. Everyone seems to have seen something. And even the local watchman now has a personal vendetta against, you know, what he thinks is a ghost. So... This is the climate, which, I mean, I've seen it described as, you know, collective hysteria. I don't think it was that hardcore, but, you know, it's very, very much a very stressful atmosphere right now. You know, at the beginning of 1804 in January, when, you know, the rest of our story takes place. We're going to now meet our main character, who's called Francis Smith. Francis Smith is 29 year old 
and he's an excise officer. So for context, I didn't know that an excise officer is basically a tax collector who collects taxes on specifically household goods such as alcohol, which made them not particularly popular back then. <laughs> One night, Francis Smith decides that he's going to help the watchman William Girdler to catch the Hammersmith ghost. He doesn't decide that at 3 in the afternoon, though. He decides that after going to the pub, going back home, keeping on drinking, getting all excited in, you know, in his living room, he then takes his blunderbuss and goes out to find Girdler. Apparently, he's not the only one to do this kind of stuff. So Girdler is not particularly surprised and he gives him basically another beat different than his own and he tells him okay we're gonna probably cross each other at some point so what we say when we see a silhouette is we just shout who comes here and the code to make sure that you know there's no threat is to answer a friend so you know they shake hands and they go their separate ways Smith has heard a rumor super recently that the ghost is now hanging out down Black Lion Lane. So he decides to go there. Francis Smith is now patrolling down this very, very dark street because remember, there's no public lighting, there's no electricity inside the homes. So he's in this very, very dark street when he sees in a distance what he will describe later as a ghostly figure a tall white bright spot in the darkness terrified because he thinks he's facing the hammersmith ghost francis smith takes his blunderbuss aims very quickly mumbles shouts something along the lines of who's there and immediately shoots without really waiting for an answer. The silhouette falls to the ground and as he approaches, Francis Smith realizes that he did not kill a ghost, he just killed a man. Distraught and probably fairly confused, Francis Smith then decides to walk up the street looking for help. That's where he finds two men Mr. Stowe and Mr. Locke, and he tells them that he's just shot a man. He brings them to the site where the body is still on the floor, and he attempts to give the two men an explanation about what he's just done. Because it's a very small community, the three men are probably very aware of who's lying at their feet right now. It's a young plasterer called Thomas Melwood, who was many things, but he was definitely not a ghost. He was on his way to pick up his wife from her work so that she wouldn't have to go home in the darkness. He was only 23. Girdler, the watchman, eventually finds them and Francis Smith hands himself in. He's sent to Newgate Prison awaiting trial. The charges are willful murder. Very soon after his arrest, the press gets interested. Francis Smith's story has all the all marks of a media success. It has a sensational murder, a supernatural aspect, and also a main character, Francis Smith, that the everyday man and woman can relate to. Because that's the thing, in the context of the, 19th, the early 19th century, the idea that you can you know, kill someone <laughs> by mistake because you think they're a ghost and you've seen this white silhouette walk towards you on the street seems to be something that people think could happen to them as well. And, you know, you will feel bad for the guy when he gets arrested for that. 
So the public opinion is very sympathetic of Smith. And that's something you're, we're going to see later during his trial. So the trial starts and Francis Smith's defense has an interesting strategy to try to get their client off. First of all, they call in witnesses who are here to testify of the good character of Smith about, you know, him not being violent, not being, you know, have not having a grudge against Thomas Millwood. And on the other hand, they also make sure that every time they're going to get a witness on the stand who's a local, they try to question them about the ghost. Like, are you aware that there is a ghost around? Were you scared of the ghost? This kind of line of questioning. Just to basically show that Francis had a good reason to act this way. And in a way that he acted in self-defense according to the extent of you know his knowledge and his beliefs. So all the people that we've heard about so far, such as Locke, and Girdler all take the stand and they all basically tell their version of the story. They also all, you know, Girdler already has met the ghost, according to himself. Um, Stoll also says that he's aware that there's a ghost around. So they all confirm the fact that this is not an excuse or some kind of invention that Francis Smith has invented to, you know, get away with murder. Melwood's sister also takes the stand and she explains that because she had a bad feeling about him going out at night so late, she went outside her house, because I think Melwood lives with his sister and his father, um, she went outside the house to wait for him to come back and she did hear the gunshots and she also heard what Smith said to Melwood, like the kind of warning sentence he said. And she did confirm that he didn't really wait for any answer before shooting. He also shot him from quite a close range. So, I mean, I do think that like the general story around the Hammer Smith goes is, is very, even today is very sympathetic of Francis Smith. But I mean, th there is an aspect of this story that is bothering me a little bit about like this drunk man, you know, going around with say, his rifle because he's decided to take the matter in his own hands and then getting terrified as soon as he see a man dressed in white and shooting him from a very, very close range. Like, it doesn't su it doesn't seem really fair on Melwood to just say, oh, it's a honest mistake because, you know, a lot is happening here that could have been avoided. <laughs> a woman who lived with Thomas Melwood called Mrs. Fulbrook also t took the stand and she said something that was really interesting for the jury and the people in the room. She explains that it's not the first time that Melwood has been mistaken for the Hammersmith ghost. She tells the jury that a few days before he died, Millwood had told her that someone on the street shouted at him, there goes the ghost, and he just basically told them to just leave. And Fulbrook did advise him that he should put on a dark coat or something after work to hide his white work clothes. But Millwood said that there was absolutely no danger, and he refused to listen, because for him, all of this sounded a little bit silly. Now, I don't know if Fulbrook was brought on the stand by the defense, but if she was, that's, I think, a genius move because just by telling this story, she shows the jury that it wasn't just Smith who made this mistake. And it, ke it just keeps insisting on that point, and I think that's why people felt sympathetic of Francis Smith is it, it's just insisting on oh it could have happened to anyone so I think this story really shows that yes it happened before he in a way it's also a little bit of victim blaming of like he should have put on that coat she told him he he like I mean the parallel a, a very bad parallel could be made but she told him he should have dressed differently and because he didn't he had it coming so and of course, I don't think it's true. You know, I think the bloke just 
went to work and he didn't think someone would try to kill him because he was a ghost. But unfortunately, um, yeah, it, it happened. Once all of the witnesses have taken the stand, it's now time for the jury to make a decision. So before he sends the jury away, the judges decide to give them a little bit of a conclusion. Um, and he explains to them that usually you do need malicious intent to indict, but that is not necessary. Francis Smith's disposition of mind was to kill and what is worth for a man killing for a mistaken identity works for supernatural entities. So basically what the judge is saying that no one would argue that if you decide to kill your neighbor and you know you see a bloke on the street dressed exactly the same and looking like him and you think it's your neighbor, you kill that guy. It turns out it's not him. It's still murder, isn't it? No one would argue that it's just an accident because you had an intent to kill when you went out that day. So in a way, it's a murder is a murder. So what he's saying is that it doesn't really matter if you want to kill a supernatural entity. Um, if you had an intent to kill, well, you it's murder, which is, you know, interesting because I guess you could argue that this guy like would, you know, for him, it was more analogous to hunting, let's say, and it would be more like you know, a hunter, and it happens all the time, let's be honest, uh, a hunter going out and killing a cyclist or a jogger <laughs> uh, by accident. Um, and, I mean, people do find them excuses, I suppose. So I guess, like, I don't think it's a legal dilemma that is completely settled, really. The judge also explains that he doesn't really want to create a precedent of people getting away with murder because if they think it's a ghost that they're trying to kill or, you know, he also doesn't want to create a precedent that if you want to settle a score with supernatural entities, yeah, just go ahead. You won't be punished. So basically, that's his last ju like, you know, judgment as a judge before he sends the jury away. But the last word will be given to the jury. So the jury comes back after some deliberation and their verdict is manslaughter now that is not something that the judge is very happy with and he basically tells them no one asked you is either you indict for murder or you acquit but you can't change the the charges basically and and uh, smith has been charged with uh, willful murder so the jury is trying to say that it's not really a murder it's more accidental etc and i think in a way i mean i suppose they do have a point but that's not a point that the judge is willing to hear so he just sends them away again and he's just like no no that's not what i asked you this is also the moment that the lord chief steps in and he's supporting the judge by making two different points. The first point is, if a person is a convicted felon, escapes from prison, and the person sent to apprehend him shoots and kills him, I mean, remember that this is in the context that the police doesn't really exist back then. So I guess the person sent to apprehend him like implies that it could be I don't know, maybe the army, I don't know. But it, it's not within the context of the police because I think this statement has aged very, very badly uh, in the light of, you know, the behavior of the police these days. Um, so basically, he's basically saying that if someone kills a convicted felon that is on the run, this person is guilty of murder. Um, the second point he makes is that the, first, the fact that Millwood's face and body was blackened proves that Smith was incredibly close to Millwood when he shot him. So this shows that this is really, really close range and that he didn't really give him a chance. And it's not, you know, someone panicking with a rifle from a distance, you know. It's definitely someone that, you know, if you have one last bit of common sense left you don't aim a gun at someone's face and shoot. Unless you're absolutely convicted they're a ghost, which I suppose Smith was. 
So after receiving what really sounds like a lecture, the jury comes back and gives a guilty verdict. So in this context, a guilty verdict means death penalty. But that said, as I was saying, the public opinion was heavily leaning on Smith's side and thought that the transition from manslaughter to murder was unfair, which, you know, is understandable. Uh, a respite was then pronounced, which means that the proceedings were paused for a bit. And as soon, basically, as soon as the respite was pronounced, um, Smith's a, a lawyer just ran to um, the crown, basically, and asked for some kind of royal pardon, uh, which Smith received. And what happened is that instead of being um, executed, he only had to do something really like light, like one year of labor or something like that, which is, I mean, it, it's not pleasant, but uh, it's, it, you know, in comparison, it's, it's basically a slap on the wrist, isn't it? So that's how it ended for Francis Smith, which is a pretty happy ending, I would say. I don't know what happened to him after that. I would like to know, honestly, I would like to know what he did after his one year of labor. You know, if he, you know, kept being an excise officer and just went back to Hammersmith and, you know, if he was treated well by his neighbors and if people resented him for killing Millward. So, yeah, I don't really know where to look for that information. I've looked quite fairly, you know, thoroughly. But, um, yeah, I guess I guess you can just imagine whatever ending you wish for, for Smith. So that was the story of the Hammersmith ghost. It's uh, another 19th century ghost. I found this story really fascinating. Um, a lot of it happens in a courthouse. So there's a lot of written traces of this entire story, which made it really interesting to read about. And also what makes it really eerie in a way is this clash between what I assume is, you know, genuine beliefs, because at some point I feel like it was the same for Spring Hill Jack. You can't really tell if people think it's actually a supernatural creature or if they think it's someone pretending to be. Like, Gurler did see someone take off a napkin from over their faces. So I, I really struggle to understand how this person can believe this is a ghost. But anyway, you have this you know, supernatural beliefs coming from, I don't know, an ancient folklore um, landscape clashing with the coldness and um, rationality of a courthouse and of these judges. And at the end of the day, I do think that even if you think that Smith was a little bit responsible, I do think that it's really hard to wish, I mean, that he, he got a stro like a, a bigger sentence. Like I don't believe in the death penalty, so I, I don't wish it on anyone, no matter what they did. But I, I, do, I do think, I, I was quite glad that he only got one year of labor. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, it, like, I think it's a guy who got scared and he really didn't want to kill another man. So that's the conclusion of this episode. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Hopefully you'll be there for the next episode, which will come out soon, I promise. It's already written and stuff. So bear with me <laughs> when I'm trying to get this schedule down. Once again, a big thank you to Ula Taylor Riley for making the music and the sound effects of this podcast. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at The Blackbird Tales or 
to send me an email. If you have anything to tell me or, you know, a DM, you can send me an email at bigsmokeblackbird at gmail.com or send me a DM on Instagram. And yes, let me know if you'd like to hear a certain story or if you have feedback about, you know, the way I make the episodes. I try to do it less scripted this time. So if you think it could be a bit more structured, I'm still trying to find this middle ground. So yes, any, any feedback is appreciated. Bye-bye!